All right. Good evening, everyone uh, attending in person and everyone watching at home to our June regular Board of Education meeting. Um, we'll start the meeting off with roll call. Beth, if you could help us with that, please. Good evening. Becker? Here. McCoy? Here. Welch? Here. Smith? Here. Vanden Heuvel? Here. Warren? Here. All right, six board members are present. Uh, Trustee Laura Layton and Warren uh, is excused from tonight's meeting for a personal matter. Um, next on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'd please stand and address the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. They moved the flag on me. <laughs> all right. Uh, before we read the uh, mission statement, I should mention uh, all six or six of our board members are here tonight. Uh, we're joined by Superintendent Steve Murley virtually as he's out of town for another engagement along with members of his cabinet. We're also joined by two members of the Inner City Student Council, uh, Emily Kopp, uh, president from Preble High School, and Stephanie Rios, also from Preble High School. Thank you for joining us, ladies. All right, uh, mission statement is next on our agenda. And Brenda, if you could read our mission statement for us. We educate all students to be college, career, and community ready, inspired to succeed in our diverse world. All right, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the open forum portion, we have three items under open forum. And first is our intercity student council report. And so I'll hand it over to Emily and Stephanie. All right, for the uh, intercity student council report, we just have some good news from the schools. So the Preble trap team took second in their division this year and sent 13 members to state. Preble had five seniors enlist in the armed forces this year. Um, Preble softball is having an amazing season and broke the record for having the most games won in a single season. Southwest high school students, Lauren Nelson and Hunter now received scholarships um, in recognition of their academic excellence. Southwest DECA students Owen Klein and Allison Rover competed in the Quick Trip statewide marketing competition through the Wisconsin Business World and earned an honorable mention in an award for their production campaign. And East had their 28th annual fishing tournament. And today, summer school had a successful start across the district. All right. Anything else? I think Emily, you mentioned everything. All right. Great. Thank you very much for that update. All right, uh, recognition portion of our agenda tonight, we have uh, a number of uh, individuals to recognize. I believe Katie DeVillers is, Katie, are you gonna come up? I think we have some plaques to hand out. Hello board, my name is Katie DeVillers, Associate Director for Pupil Services. And Katie, I don't know if your microphone is on, I'm sorry. Oh, it is. I'm just not close enough. It's not close enough. Thanks, Luis. Thanks, no Luis. He always saves me. Hi, I'm Katie DeVillers, Associate Director for Pupil Services, and I'm here and I have the honor tonight of talking to you about two people that are with us and some others who have been part of grant work that we have done for the last two years with a focus on school based mental health. Um, and specifically for our Latino and Somali communities. With me is Luis um, Franco. He is our family engagement team member, and he has been integral to this work as well. And Bree Decker, who is our mental health navigator, we have contracted with her for the grant, and she was the project manager of this work. And I have a plaque. Although everyone's not here, we will recognize all of them, but we're going to start with Sister Melanie Machka. Sister Melanie is from Casa Alba, Melanie, and she um, was steadfast in her dedication to the Hispanic community and for the continual guidance throughout the project to ensure it met the needs of our students and families. The plaque that she and all the others are receiving reads as follows. Sister Melanie, for your work helping to build culturally relevant resources for our local Latino, Hispanic, and Somali youth struggling with symptoms of anxiety, depression, and poor mental health. Your work will help build mental health awareness and services within our community. We thank you for your dedication to the students that we all serve.
and Pilar Perez Campos. Again, for your work in helping to build culturally relevant resources for our local Latino, Hispanic, and Somali youth struggling with symptoms of anxiety, depression, and poor mental health. Your work will help build mental health awareness and services within our community. We thank you. And specifically for you, thank you for your creative work on the awareness posters. The project was a great success because of your efforts. And there are some that are not with us tonight that we want to recognize. Elvida Erdman, Disabilities Rights Wisconsin. We wanna thank her for sharing her expertise to ensure that parents got the information in a way that they needed to support their children. Regina Huwa Proctor, Brown County Mental Health and Human Services. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise related to clinical substance abuse to ensure that parents got the information that they needed to support their children. Saeed Hassan from Kamsa, thank you for your willingness to collaborate with us, your dedication to the Somali community and for the continual guidance throughout this project to ensure it met the needs of the community. To Mohammed Mohammed from Kamsa, thank you for your willingness to collaborate with us, your dedication to the Somali community and for the continual guidance throughout this project to ensure it met the needs of the community we, that we will send you your plaque on your behalf to Saeed. Saeed's going to send his, uh, Mohammed's his plaque. That's why I wanted to make sure he knew he got it. And then Adan Her from Kamsa. Thank you for your work on the introduction to the mental health videos. The project was a great success because of your efforts. And finally, Dr. Yolo Diaz, MD, from the New Community Clinic. Thank you for sharing your expertise in supporting families, identify and supporting their child with issues related to mental illness. We couldn't have done this without our providers and we really appreciate them and your work too. Thanks. Thank you. I know that uh, uh, Lori Blakesley wants to make sure she gets pictures. Uh, so if you're staying for a little longer, great. If you want to step out and make sure that we get pictures taken, um, would appreciate that. All right, we are moving on to the public forum portion of our agenda. Um, we certainly want to offer opportunities for anyone in person who wants to address the board to do so. Certainly those who are uh, watching and participating at home, we will continue to do um, our, the phone in option and people are able to register on our site there. Um, if you have a form in the audience right now and you uh, want to address the board on, uh, either before the meeting starts or certainly right now, you can bring your form up to Beth and she'll bring it up to me. Um, we do have a number of people registered to speak, and so we'll take those in the order in which we receive them. Um, just want to point out when you uh, you come to the, the podium, make sure that adjust the microphone as needed, uh, introduce yourself and uh, give us your address, and then you have uh, five minutes um, to speak to the board. All right, so uh, we have the first, uh, it's probably going to be multiple people, I believe, uh, Marlene Fiera. Farah and Nick as well, uh, if you'd like to, to come up. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, for the new board members and new superintendent who may not be familiar uh, with our background, my father, uh, Pete Farah, along with Chris Wagner, former principal at Preble, and Dan Nierad, former superintendent. Uh, we're very instrumental in bringing the Italian language to the Green Bay Public Schools uh, high school curriculum at Preble. Um, since that time, uh, WIS Italia, the uh, state organization, state Italian organization, has made a donation to the program every year to be used for learning materials and supplies and things of that nature to further uh, assist the program. Uh, joining us tonight is Al Rolandi, the president of WIS Italia, uh, Tiafo, the president of Club Italo Americano of Green Bay and several other, other, other club members are with us here tonight. Um, so with that being said, uh, my mother Marlene and I would like to present a check uh, on behalf of my father, Pete Fair, in the amount of $2,000 to Preble High School to continue the good work with the Italian language program. That's it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
thank you very much for your donation. I know this is a, an annual thing. We appreciate it very much that you, you come here and, and um, for the work that you guys do to support our students in our program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, next on the open forum registration, uh, Kathy Saharsky. Hello. Is it on? Yep, you're good, thank you. <laughs> okay, tell me when to start. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Kathy Saharsky. I live on Warm Springs Drive, uh, 54311. I currently have a junior in high school uh, that goes to Preble. So I kind of wanted to make that known right away that in regards to what I'm speaking really has nothing to do with my student and does not affect her at all. So I have zero skin in the game um, on what I'm talking about. Um, I really want to talk about the mask requirement that you have impl implemented, excuse me, for summer school for grades K to eight. Um, basically, I feel that the, basically when you guys next last Monday had a closed session at noon, I believe, where you guys had a PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation during the day uh, regarding mask wear, Mary, wearing, I don't believe I've seen that presentation that I'm aware of. I don't believe any other parents did. So we don't have any idea what you guys discussed regarding the mask wearing. Um, and you had the meeting Monday night you voted in 32 minutes and we have no no representation as far as engagement, transparency and what was discussed in that meeting. Um, according to the local health and safety board, masks were to be optional for all grades. Uh, De Pere School District, as of June 9th, masks are optional for all grades and optional for all buildings. I feel that parents should be responsible for this medical decision regarding their child and wearing the mask, not the school. If, if parents choose to have their child continue to wear a mask, that's their choice. That's not your decision to make. I know we have heard this a lot this year. Follow the science, follow the science. I'd like to read you some science that I found yesterday online. Children, children's in grades six to eight are the least likely group to contract and spread the virus. Probably the most important group that I feel needs to see their teachers and peers during learning instruction and social interaction. This is also quoted from the CDC that I took yesterday off their website, which is the science you're supposed to be following. Less than 10% of COVID cases in the United States have been among children and adolescents aged five to 17 years. In Michigan and Wisconsin, yes, the CDC does, state our, does put our state in there. Delivery of in-person instruction was not associated with increased spread of COVID-19 in the schools when community transmission was low. When community transmission was low, there was no association between in-person learning and community spread, end quote. In, also in relation to that community spread, I got this statistic right off of um, our Facebook group that, that we have to uh, advocate for the students. Here is the new COVID info courtesy of the Green Bay Area Public Schools COVID dashboard. Currently there is one one hundredth of 1% 1 of active cases yet we are mandatorily masking our youngest children. These little voices, I'm sorry, it's emotional for me. These little voices in our school district have no voice. We need to be the voice for them. It's summer, these masks are hot. Per the American Institute of Health from their website, around 20 minutes of wearing a mask, they were wet and saturated. They also stated that the masks were no longer effective when they weren't, when they weren't dry. I'm pretty sure after wearing these masks for six to eight hours, they are no longer dry at that point. I'd also like to remind you also the CDC that you guys are following and Dr. Fauci has not been clear and continues to be confusing on the asymptomatic spread and mask guidance and even vac vaccination safety. We need to get back to a common sense approach. Green Bay Public Schools is the largest district in Brown, Brown County yet continues to lack the leadership for the other schools to follow. I found myself going to the small districts in our area to get information to see where we were going because we're way behind the curve. This decision being made in regards to the virus that you guys make always seems to be behind the other schools in the area. The constitution and our right to choose what's right for our children does not become obsolete during a pandemic. 
We've dealt with the seasonal flu, the rotavirus. We have never, ever, ever masked the healthy. I get that a long time ago, we didn't know about this, but we know way, way more about this. If your child is sick, they need to stay home. This age group should not be able, should be able, excuse me, to be kids and act like kids. It's summer. And I think these masks should be removed from the K to eight age group and the choice should be to the parents. It comes right back to the issue of choice. We went through this in January on whether to provide in-person learning in addition to virtual. We asked the school board to give the parents a choice. We're asking again. I think the parents should be able to decide if their children should be masked or not. There's so many parents that are afraid to speak and that's why I'm here. I'm trying to speak for them. They're gonna be labeled as something they believe in if they choose to speak up. And it's great to see the amount of people here tonight. These important decisions regarding the smallest of voices in our schools need to be put back into the hands of the parents. And lastly, completely off, off of this topic, I'd just like to thank all our Green Bay Public School teachers across the grades and our district for tirelessly working to adapt to this ever-changing learning challenges this year and continuing to put the students first and foremost, and especially all the teachers from Preble. And we're blessed with the teachers. Thank you, Kathy. I just want to, I just want to to point out um, policy prevents us from having dialogue about this specific topic and any other topics that are brought up because I'm we're not posted. Um, but I'll I'll follow up with you tomorrow. Thank you. All right. Um, yep. Next person um, registered is Denise Gomer Hutchinson. Good evening, I'm Denise Gummer Hutchison and I live at 3184 Herman's Road in New Franken. My children went to Weequiock, Red Smith and Preble. But I'm here tonight as a board member of the League of Women Voters of Greater Green Bay and the chair of the Education Committee to share with you a very rewarding program the League had the opportunity to engage in with one of your teachers. The League of Women Voters, as you know, is a nonpartisan grassroots organization established in 1920 that advocates for informed and active participation in government. Our members are women and men who work to improve our systems of government and impact public policies through education and advocacy. The League neither supports nor opposes candidates for any office at any level of government. But at the same time, the League is wholeheartedly engaged and works to influence public policy through advocacy and engaging people in the voting process. Because of this mission, one area of focus for the League is public education and the importance of educating and engaging children, young adults in civic education and government, and to partner with our community's public schools for the advancement of all children in our community. This last year, 2020-2021, the League of Women Voters of Greater Green Bay became involved in a program that was started by the League of Women Voters of Connecticut with Harvard University. The Harvard Civics Project is an initiative formed to bring case method teaching to high schools and to use this methodology to deepen students' understandings of American democracy. Based on the highly successful experience of Harvard Business Schools and other graduate and professional programs that use case-based teaching, the case method can be employed to strengthen high school education as well, ensuring a more exciting, relevant and effective experience for students and teachers across a range of subjects. The case method can be especially effective in engaging students with topics of history and democracy. And its, pres and its presence is unique, a, unique, excuse me, a unique opportunity to help reverse the broad decline in civic education and civic engagement in the United States. The Greater Green Bay Area League nominated an outstanding active high school teacher who teaches grades nine through 12 of US history, government or civics to attend a case method workshop taught by Harvard Business School professor, David Moss. We nominated Jason Krings, a history teacher at Southwest High School. Jason was accepted for the workshop where he agreed to attend the programs at or through Harvard and come back to his classroom and teach cases in his class. And to conclude the program, he will moderate a one community case discussion with our league and other members of the community. This opportunity between the league and Jason is an example of how our community 
and our public schools work to enhance and expand learning opportunities for our children, bringing resources to them from all over the country. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Greater Green Bay, we thank the Green Bay Area Public School District and the Green Bay Education Association for allowing us to bring this opportunity forward, for helping us identify Jason, and for the immense honor of working with an outstanding teacher, Jason Krings. The children of Southwest High School are very lucky to have a teacher willing to take on extra work to deliver new and innovative opportunities to his students and his colleagues. So thank you very much to the school board, to the school district, and to the educators within this school district who are willing to look at new and important opportunities. Jason is here tonight with me, and I'd like to give him an opportunity to say a few words. All right, Jason's also registered to speak. Jason, you can go next. Hi, my name is Jason Krings, and I live at 2626 Gemini Road. Thank you, Denise, first of all, and, and the League of Women Voters, and thank you, members of the school board. Uh, like Denise said, in April, I had the pleasure of virtually attending Harvard University's American Democracy Case Method Workshop. Led by Dr. David Moss and based upon the highly successful case-based curriculum of the Harvard Business School, the Case Method is a unique curriculum that engages students in the study and discussion of U.S. history, government, civics, and democracy. Over the last decade, the number of Case Method teachers has grown, and the program has been shown to strengthen high school student performance through the usage of engaging, exciting discussion lessons across a range of subjects. The case method is especially effective at engaging students with topics in history and democracy because it puts them in the case and asks them to understand context, analyze multiple perspectives, and make tough choices about issues central to American democracy, all while en engaging in positive and meaningful discourse. The program presents a unique opportunity to increase civic engagement. In the United States, at a time when it is most necessary for students to be involved in a positive discussion of democratic ideals. I myself had the pleasure of teaching the Martin Luther King and struggle for black voting rights case in my AP US history course this spring and found it to be the week that many of my students enjoyed the most out of this entire school year. I substituted the case for a more traditional teaching plan on civil rights and I plan to continue to substitute cases into our current overlapping curriculum. Some of the benefits that I saw this last spring were a more engaged discussion, the ability to see the thematic connections over a long period of time, in, for instance, for this case from the Civil War, to the connection to segregation, and to the connection to civil rights, to the connection to Black Lives Matter, and ethical valuing and decision making where they were able to realize how important it is for citizens to promote and protect democracy. My vision for this program is to encourage more teachers in my department or in the district to attend Dr. Moss's workshop at Harvard, hopefully in person. Ultimately, I would like to teach an upper level semester long American democracy case-based course to develop college prep skills and to help students understand that participation in a democracy is necessary for the health of a nation. This would provide them with the analytical, the ethical and the diplomatic skills necessary for life outside of high school. I'll close by thanking my students at Southwest High School for their willingness to try something new. I came back from the workshop and said, we're doing a case discussion in a year that was stressful for everyone. They were willing to take on a large amount of reading and a discussion lesson that required them to take risks in front of their peers. And finally, I'd like to thank Denise and the League of Women Voters. We are constantly looking for opportunities in school to partner with groups in the community. And this has not only been a wonderful partnership, but one that I hope to continue. And like Denise said, this summer, I have the pleasure of teaching a case to interested members as they celebrate their 100th anniversary. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jason. All right, uh, next registered speaker is Melanie Holly. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, that's good. All right, Melanie Holly, 3410 Whittier Drive, Green Bay, 54311. I would like to start by saying thank you for giving us the option for in-person attendance at tonight's meeting. It's so nice to see all these faces. So some of the information may be redundant that I'm gonna share as it reiterates what other speakers have said tonight and throughout this year. However, the points are critical and need to be heard. My disappointment with the district board began after the school year started when there seemed to be no urgency 
or creative thinking to provide an option for in-person learning as surrounding districts shared and implemented their plans. Given the disdain felt by many families, our board president and superintendent reached out to meet with a group of us and hear our concerns, which was a welcome and positive step. The discussion which occurred right before Thanksgiving was productive and as parents, we were able to have dialogue and understand why certain decisions had been made. We left the meeting encouraging more proactive, transparent communication to help regain and build trust. Unfortunately, no action was taken after the meeting by Eric or Steve to continue this dialogue. Families may not agree with decisions that are made and that's completely understandable. And this is something we, should, we all have to deal with. But when there is no explanation, no transparency, that is when trust is broken and families feel helpless. The board's slow progress on providing options for our children continued, which has led us to where we are now. This trust must also be restored with district employees. And I'm speaking specifically to those who are impacted most by your decisions, our teachers. As an employer, your lack of upfront communication is negatively impacting your team members. As an employer, I'm sorry, those who have worked their hearts out this year, finding out information on returning to in-person learning hours before families, hearing updates through the media. Is this how you cultivate trust in your workplace? I challenge you to do better. My most recent observations are from the June 7th special meeting a motion was brought forward by our own district health and safety team that we have established to make masks optional for all, indoors and outdoors. For those who aren't aware, this team is comprised of almost 30 district employees, ranging in areas of expertise from facilities to administration to nursing. However, you as board members did not trust this team or your board president who supported this motion. You felt you must somehow have done research that supports your narrative or have more knowledge than the team whose main purpose, main goal is to ensure all students and staff remain healthy and safe by following best practices. Once again, not a way to promote trust in our district. Our family has loved our schools, our teachers, our building administrators. We don't wanna leave this district, but the pattern of decision-making among our board does not provide much reassurance for next school year. What we are asking for is so simple, increase communication and transparency, provide reasons for your decisions. They might not always be what we wanna hear, but we need to know how you got there and build trust. Please work to make improvements as families are watching and have decisions to make about open enrollment. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next, we have Brooke Andrews. Is Brooke here? Oh, there she is. Good evening. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, Brooke Andrews, 3150 Outing Court, Green Bay, 54313. Uh, to say it's been a trying year would be an understatement. Um, this board makes many claims, and I say claims because you never seem to have any proof to support the statements, but you all claim that you're receiving and hearing and acting on behalf of both sides of the issues we face this year. However, your actions are indicative of the opposite. Your actions indicate that you're only listening to one side. There has been a group of us that have been screaming at you for choice since October. We've been screaming for you to allow our kids to attend school in person for a multitude of reasons, but essentially it all breaks down to virtual school has not been working for so many. You claim to have heard us, yet you ignored our cries and kept on for months with the virtual models, ignoring health, mental health, failing grades, lack of participation, lack of engagement, and all of the other difficulties this method has posed on our teachers and our students. Um, the same group has been screaming at you that you, are not make, that you are not to be making decisions about the health of the greater Green Bay area and the surrounding communities. Those decisions that you made for us were decisions 
that we should have been able to make for ourselves with our own research, our own opinion, our own beliefs, with the help of our family doctors and our own assessments of risk. You were to be making decisions about the education of our students. Your job at that time was to provide a choice to the families and the staff of GBAPS to allow them the opportunity to attend in-person learning or virtual learning, whatever model was a better fit for them. Yet you told us you decided for us what was best for all of us and ignored our voice and took away our choice. Follow the science, you say. The science says the youngest kids are the least likely to be seriously impacted or affected, yet you've chosen to keep them masked in schools. CDC has relaxed quarantine restrictions, but the district task force is still applying a much more stringent protocol from last October when things were far more dire. An example, a middle schooler comes into a close contact with a confirmed positive on May 3rd. The parent is contacted on May 11th. That's eight days. That child was in school for eight days before she was asked to be sent home and quarantined for the remainder of her 14 days. So another six days that she had to be out of school. Is this what we're calling engagement? That same group of people that's been screaming is now screaming for you to unmask our kids and allow for choice in vaccination. Instead, you're deciding for us all what is in everyone's best interest not your place. You've created rules and parameters that even your own administration and personnel can't keep up with. Fostering an environment where parents and families are catching your employees not following the rules that they are so stringently trying to enforce and uphold. Example, teachers and administration out running errands maskless on Wednesday afternoons because it's their day off, which you've so you know, you've been so adamant in sharing with us that Wednesdays are not a day off. They're, they're, it's a school day. Um, also, the same, the, same, the same thing is happening with your teachers and your administration. Um, pictures are surfacing of those people maskless at school functions. You guys can't even implement your own rules. Is this what GBEP is considering excellence? Uh, what is perfectly fine and acceptable at one school is completely unacceptable at another. An example? A high school on the east side of town has a football team. Several, I want to say five plus members, test positive on that football team. Those kids stay home and quarantine themselves, yet the season continues for the rest of the players. When another area high school on the west side of town, one member of that team tests positive, the whole program is shut down for two weeks. Is that what GBAPS is calling equity? You provide no transparency to the people you serve. You continue to insult their intelligence. You dodge your inquiries and you refuse to allow choice back in our schools. You have flat out refused to provide information we've requested as far as just how many families have left the district and how many more have filed open enrollment paperwork to leave. Media outlets have requested the same information and your response to these requests have been that you are not obligated to create a metric to track something in order to fulfill a Freedom of Information Act request. That's in quotes. I find it hard to believe that this district cannot, with a good deal of accuracy, project that our enrollment numbers will look like as the district needs to adequately staff and either add and in all likelihood reallocate and not backfill teaching positions due to, an in, due to a decrease in enrollment. Choice. This isn't a new concept. Our group has been about choice since the beginning. From day one, we've always been advocating for choice. Choice to attend in-person school or stay virtual. Choice to wear masks or not. Choice for people to assess their own risk. Choice for parents and students to do what they feel is best for them academically, as well as from a mental health standpoint. On the other side of the coin, another subset of people have been coming at you telling you that they that the only right thing to do is to keep schools closed or to keep the kids masked or to enforce the vaccines. That was five minutes. Yeah, I'll let you wrap up a few, um, just a few seconds. Um, I guess in um, to wrap it up, the only way to get back to some semblance of normal is to provide choice, give it back to the people, to the families. It's the right thing to do. Uh, the issues here are not black and white. There is some gray matter here and it can't keep being ignored. This group will not be going away. We will keep fighting for the truth, for what is right and for choice. You all need to stop sharing a brain and start listening to both sides of the, the issues. Thank you. All right, uh, next registered, uh, just as a reminder, if you have a form, uh, you can still turn it in, get it over to Beth and we can get it up here. But uh, next form is from Beth Lane.
I'm Beth Lane, 1841 7th Street, and I'm going to talk about what's actually on the agenda tonight. So first, I would like to thank all of you, uh, even though you all know that I don't always agree with you on everything, and I argue with you all quite a bit. I do appreciate the work and the effort that you guys have put in this year because I know that it is more than any of you signed up for. Um, and on that note, I would really like to encourage all of you to not vote to purchase Cup of Joy tonight because I think it is fiscally irresponsible. I think that it is not going to solve the issues that you feel are going to be solved. Uh, moving the people from this building into a new building and expecting them to equally amazingly be welcoming is not going to solve the problem. I think that answering phones when people call would probably solve some of the issue. I think that preparing families who have never been involved in the district, who have never come to the district for what to expect when they get here would go a long way. So I really would just like you guys to take that under consideration. And then I guess I'd also like to share how much I enjoyed your <coughs> open session meeting that you had about masking and the presentation that you posted on the website for everyone's viewing pleasure and have a great evening. Uh, next uh, registered speaker, speaker, excuse me, is Shana Espinoza. There she is. Go ahead, Shana. All right. I'm Shana Espinosa. Do you want my address too? Sure. 3178 East Breeze Lane, Green Bay, Wisconsin. I am the parent of a student at Barrett Elementary. I am also an elementary teacher in the district and my husband teaches middle school. First of all, I am thankful that the Green Bay Area Public School District has been the leader in Brown County in following CDC recommendations, even when other districts were loosening their requirements. I am confident that our district's burden rate, even in the most urban parts of our county, remained close to the county's burden rate due to our district's diligence in remaining virtual for as long as we did, and then masking, social distancing, screening, quarantining, and contact tracing. In fact, I think our burden rate may have been greater than Brown County's due to more accurate screening and contact tracing than surrounding districts. I'm also thrilled that everyone 12 years of age and older is now eligible to be vaccinated against COVID. Still, I'm the parent of a newly six-year-old who is similarly thrilled about attending both sessions of summer school in the mornings and afternoons. A six-year-old who cannot be vaccinated yet, who will be around peers who cannot be vaccinated yet, as she was today, and most likely around some adults who have either chosen not to be vaccinated or cannot be vaccinated for medical reasons. Since the district is only asking staff members to voluntarily inform human resources if they have received the COVID-19 vaccine, which I did and informed the district, the district is completely unable to assure parents that our children's teachers and staff have been vaccinated. As such, my daughter, my husband, and I are proud that the district has remained a leader in Brown County. I was pleased to hear that Ashwabanan also, I believe, um, has continued to require masks. By continuing to require masks at the elementary and middle school level, as long as it is recommended by the Centers for Disease Control. So thank you. Still, there's another area in which the Green Bay Area Public School District historically has been a leader, not only in the county, but in the state. Yet instead of continuing to lead, our district is going backwards to practices that are not research-based or best practice. The area of which I am speaking is our bilingual program. As you are aware, we have a partnership with Hanover Research and are developing an education committee, leadership team, advisory committee, and task force. At a meeting on May 25th, bilingual stakeholders were told that the district and GBA is working to shape the bilingual task force. While bilingual stakeholders are pleased to be one of the first few groups to be part of the process, many bilingual stakeholders, including myself, are deeply disappointed that changes are being made to the bilingual program prior to going through the process with Hanover, particularly the Spanish language acquisition model. The district's bilingual FAQ page specifically states, the district has moved to the Spanish language acquisition model in schools where we cannot 
find bilingual teachers. As a teacher at Dan's Elementary and former teacher at Sullivan Elementary, I know this statement is blatantly untrue. There are bilingual teachers in fourth and fifth grade at both Dan's and Sullivan. In fact, by moving to the Spanish language acquisition or SLA, space issues are being created at Dan's Elementary where the SLA teacher now needs a separate space instead of being a regular classroom teacher. This means at least two other classroom teachers will need to share a team up and share a classroom, even when we don't know if any COVID mitigation procedures will still be in place in the fall prior to elementary students being vaccinated. So what would I like you to do? As both a teacher and a parent of a student in the bilingual program, I plead with this board to answer Green Bay, Edu Green Bay Education Association's question and my question, why is the SLA model being expanded while we are in the midst of this process with Hanover? If it's not based on staffing, what is it based on? Bilingual stakeholders met with Superintendent Murley on July 28th last year. In a memorandum on November 16th, 2020, to Stephen Murley, Vicki Beyer, Nancy Chartier, Georgina Cornu, and Linda Teske, the GBA wrote a proposal and requested a meeting with the district to discuss a proposal to modify the dual language model language allocation plan back to a minimum of 50% Spanish, 50% English, as well as improve student learning outcomes to receive the seal of biliteracy by high school graduation. This meeting has not occurred to this date. I am asking that this meeting occur, I just have one or two more lines, as soon as possible, as well as receiving an answer to the question as to why the Spanish language acquisition model is being expanded at this time, not due to staffing and prior to going through the process with Hanover. I personally asked this question during the bilingual education update meeting on May 25th and did not receive a response. GBA has asked this question to Superintendent Murley, so I asked this board to review the district's bilingual program Q&A page and provide answers to these questions as soon as possible. I do not understand why we've been waiting since November 16th while the district is going ahead with the expansion of SLA not based on staffing. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your feedback in the days following this meeting. Thank you, Shana. Beth, did you receive any other in-person? Okay, we do have two uh, people who requested phone calls uh, tonight. Josh, are you able to help us with that? Okay, I'll keep an eye on the screen. Oh, excuse me. Is that Shauna? Shauna? Yeah. Oh. I didn't know, like, I'm new to this. No, come on up. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, I heard the phone ring and I thought. <laughs> it would have been great if you would have answered it, just taking it from there. <laughs> Take your time. My name, oh, go ahead, my name is Sean. Ooh. Sorry. My name is Shauna Van Roy. I live at 1409 Wolverine Trail, New Franken, 54229. Um, I am an RN and I am a retired military RN. I have been in the military for 26 years. I'm coming to the board about the situation with the mask because it is critical and dangerous with this mask and the heat. And I'll tell you why. I think masks should be optional for this summer school. The weather is getting hot, and by wearing masks, it's creating more of a health issue than the COVID itself. It's going to be a difficult time for people to breathe in upcoming heat. I know that because I get heat and I can't breathe. These masks can create heat exhaustion, heat stroke, fatigue, respiratory distress, dehydration, bacteria pneumonia, which is caused by inhaling sweat and moisture inside these masks. Once these masks get wet and you don't switch out these masks, they're not functional anymore. And aspiration pneumonia, and that's when it's people are running around and they vomit in their mask and it goes into their lungs. Kids these young are at high risk for getting sick because they do not know to keep drinking water. And that is only the physical aspect. There are, only, there are also psychological issues like anxiety and depression. It's not only affecting the kids, but it's affecting the teachers. 
my son was so excited that he finally got to go to school this year because he struggled with virtual learning and he really missed his friends. My son, le my son learns better with kids his own age. He really thought he would be okay wearing a mask because he hated virtual learning. But as days went on, he struggled to keep the mask on. He was sent to the principal's office multiple times because he felt he could not breathe. And it got worse when it got hotter outside. The school allowed him one time during the day for 15 minutes to go outside and take the mask off. And he struggled to keep the mask on. My son's speech even got worse with, with the mask on. In gym, he had to run outside or inside with the mask on and he almost passed out because he could not breathe. My son loves sports and he had to quit track because of the mask. And now that you made the decision about the K through eight grades, wearing masks for the summer schools, he dropped his summer school class because he cannot absolutely run with a mask and not pass out. The class was basketball, basketball and he did, does love basketball. My son is not the only one that wants to quit his summer school class. There's multiple parents that do. I would be surprised that multiple classes do not get dropped this summer because of your decision. How can you expect a child to run around and play sports and breathe in this heat with a mask on? Do you really think this is safe? I would not be surprised if the kids start passing out during the summer classes, even if it's not a sports class. What about the instructors? Is it really that safe for them to wear a mask? When a CDC says, recommends something, it means you follow their ideals, but you could also adjust the recommendations to fit the students' needs and safety, like for example, the heat. Health is not always black and white. You must get into the gray areas and just to the person's needs. If the grocery stores, restaurants, farmers markets, et cetera, can be full open capacity and no COVID restrictions, so can our schools. The same people are fighting for the masks are the ones who continue to go on public and big crowds with or without masks, without masks, and it does not seem to bother them. Even if people around them are not wearing masks and adults have a greater chance of spreading the virus more than our children. Who is to say that people not wearing the masks got vaccinated? If people are so afraid of this virus, then maybe they should take precautions for themselves and let others make the decision when it comes to our health. There's no reason why we cannot compromise. We cannot compromise with the mask. If people want to wear the mask, that is fine. But people do not want to wear the mask, it should be fine too. We as parents should have the choice in our children's health, not you. We are paying you to make sure our children get a good education. I gave you many references, articles, videos, et cetera, regarding masks and how they are causing more harm than good. Healthy people should not be wearing masks. The mask does not stop the spread of this virus. It does not protect you from the virus. Even tells you that in the box of masks, it says it does not protect you from the COVID virus. I even have a copy of it showing that. I spent many months doing a lot of research on multiple issues. I do not take this lightly. We as parents should not have to work this hard to protect our children. We all have jobs in the community to serve others. And for me to be here standing up for my kids is taking my time away from my kids. So please, please consider the mask mandates for the summer and not continue to fall. Because you know, this is months and months of research that I have did, months and videos. I know what I'm talking about when it comes to masks and health. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. All right, uh, we have one more. I just make sure, Heidi, are you here? Oh, I think she's the call, Josh. Hello? Heidi, can you hear me? I can, can you hear All me? Right. Yep, if you could start by introducing yourself and giving us your address and then you'll have five minutes. Sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Heidi Peed, and I'm at 1611 Royal Crown Court, Green Bay, 54313. Um, I'm going to go a little off the cuff here <laughs> real quick, um, just because I get the advantage here of listening to some of these other speakers ahead of me. And the one question I would pose to the lady that wants is so adamant about masking their child at school would be, is, are you masking your child everywhere, everywhere you go outside your house? Because the rest of the world is opening up. So um, if you're just masking your child at school, um, I would have a problem with that. If you're not, great, you do you. 
All right. Shame on me for not being more aware and involved prior to this year in school board elections, school board meetings, policies and procedures, curriculum, and superintendent searches. I was only involved directly at my children's schools with PTOs, booster clubs, volunteering in the classroom, and fundraising for sports. I have always been a strong proponent of public schools. I now support open enrollment and vouchers. I have always known there were politics involved, but never to this degree. GVAP is the epitome of a politicized and unionized institution that puts the interests of the teachers union and local and state political parties first, not the education of our kids. Instead of engagement, equity, and excellence, your tagline should be inferior, ineptitude, and irresponsible. Your management of this past year has been horrendous. Poor leadership and too many cooks in the kitchen. No one can make a decision. And when you finally do, it's not rational. It's based on fear and feelings and the what if. It's the farthest thing from forward thinking. Look at your health and safety work team. You have three team leads and 23 other committee members, and yet this team couldn't figure out a plan. Two of these members aren't even GBAS employees anymore. This work team is, quote, working tirelessly and meeting two to three times a week, end quote, and yet they wait for the board to give some guidance. But the board is waiting for the superintendent for direction. But wait, the superintendent is waiting on the work team. But the work team defers to legal for input. But wait, legal is waiting on whatever agency they're following that day, whether it's the DHS, the DPI, or the CDC. It's a real-life version of who's on first. Complete ridiculousness. You can imagine my frustration then when I call the lead nurse in May and she can't give me the dates this team has met, provide the meeting minutes, or answer my questions about the latest masking and quarantine protocols. She tells me to look at the district's website under the forward plan and FAQs for information. Except the latest information under the forward plan is from February 24th, and the latest FAQs are from January 15th. This was in May. I had to file multiple open record requests to try and find any information. Not a good use of my time or yours. In your own words, quote, the changes come very quickly in regards to COVID. We are responding as rapidly as possible, end quote. If administration is talking daily and sometimes multiple times per day, again, your words, why were no changes made until June 7th? And why in the world did our school board president say they weren't going to talk about getting back to school five days a week way back in March? A lot has happened between March and the end of the school year. Besides poor leadership, we have too many with overinflated intellect and importance. You all think you know it all and you know it better than anyone else. You think you are the ones that need to make every other decision for our children except education. You ignored the family surveys of 70% that wanted to return to in-person learning. You ignored the actual number of kids that were failing. You ignored the pleas from students and parents about their mental and social well-being and the negative impact of virtual learning. You continue to ignore the science. Apparently, you all know more than the health professionals. You all know more than the surrounding school districts. You all know more about what's best for our children than we do. You insult our intelligence if you think we didn't fully understand what happened at the last meeting about masking. You turned down the recommendation from the health and safety team, but there was no discussion about it and no reasons given as to why. In addition to poor leadership, excessive administrative staff, and a less than competent school board, GVAS is overspending and continues to be irresponsible with our money. Continued pay raises while most other sectors were put on a freeze, and now you want to purchase another building for a welcome center. This is pretty ironic as you already were closing down buildings even prior to COVID, and now more families are leaving. We don't need a welcome center. We need a please don't leave our district center. And you can do that by changing your ways now. Start being transparent, start being truthful, start rebuilding trust, start doing the right thing. Start putting our children first. Thank you. That was really good timing, Heidi, thank you. All right, uh, before we wrap up open forum, last, good, all right. Moving on uh, to consent agenda, I would look, oh, sorry. Um, are there any items on the consent agenda that anyone would like removed uh, for discussion? Andrew? Uh, I'd like to remove uh, G and H, please. All right. Um, I believe we need to make a motion for that. 
I thought we had an, I thought that was something that there was a decision just, that just one able to do or that one on one board members request to be yeah. removed. Melissa, do we need yeah. to, we can just move them down there. Was that a thumbs up? Okay, just, I thought I wasn't sure if it was a, okay, perfect. All right, so G and H will move down to item number four. Uh, so I'd look for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the consent agenda uh, passes with the exception of G and H, which will move down to number four, which is next. Uh, so Andrew, I will uh, hand it over to you for, we'll just stick to G personnel action. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my, my comments about, uh, my comments about this are, are strictly process. I have no opposition to any of the people selected or who will be hired. I think they are all high quality people. So whenever I've had a situation where my concern was about process, I wanted to make that crystal clear that it's not about the the person and then if, uh, if it if it was I wouldn't say that but I am saying it is not about the people at all um, I just wanted to check to see if um, there was for the um, I guess specific to the executive director of, of HR I just wanted to check if there was board uh, board involvement on the on the interview process. Um, I was involved, Steve. Can you? No, there was not. Okay, so yet another, and I guess I guess shame on me for not making a motion that the most critical positions in the district have. A board member on the committee. Um, I know we used to have them for for all principals, um, and I know I had a discussion about it for the very highest level of of things. But it might have been, you know, behind the scenes, and maybe I made assumptions that that change was going to happen. I think specifically, you know, specifically some of these very highest level functions, and again, I. Do support the the hiring of Mary uh, Lofi Blanick. I hope I pronounced that right. I I, I do support her as a choice. Uh, I am going to vote no on the portion um, on that portion of it because I think there should have been more more of a role. Those positions can make or break how life is in a district. If if you were to not have a good HR director. And um, I look forward to a future discussion on, on that um, and making a decision and voting up or down to having board members in those interviews above a certain level and abiding by that and making it official, making it policy. Um, again, it's not it's not about the people and just to keep it simple i'm not going to ask to subdivide the one motion about administrative staff i am less concerned about um i think sometimes the case can be made for an internal transfer where the right person is just is just there and we know so i am voting yes on transfer administrative staff and employment of certified staff. I certainly think there's a board role at the very highest levels in interviews, but not at the you know, regular staff level. Um, so given that, um, just to keep it easy, I will move that uh, under item G, transfers of administrative staff as listed and employment of certified staff as listed be approved. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second the motion um, for the sake of the vote. So basically Andrew uh, wants to separate two of those um, items and, and take a separate vote on that. Is there any other discussion? 
All right. Wait, what are we? So, so if the if the vote is no, then it's it's it is no on hiring the uh, on the transfer and the employment. That would be correct. It is to not hire the people. So correct. just to be just to be clear, and I would. Okay. Um, Beth, do you want to do? I, I'm sorry. I need. Yeah, I, I would Im imagine there'd be a separate motion. Andrew doesn't wants to support two of the three. So his proposal is to separate those into two separate votes. So yes, we'll take a separate vote on that. So that just other clarify, what are we voting on this so, first vote? So the first vote we are voting on the transfer of administrative staff and the employment of certified staff on probationary contracts. So if you vote yes, you approve those things. If you vote no, you don't approve those hires. Okay. Beth, uh, do you wanna do virtual or voice vote? Voice vote, please. Okay. Okay. Welch. Aye. Well, yeah, so you're voting on those two, aye or nay? Yeah. Yes. Smith. Aye. Aye. McCoy. Aye. Vanden Heuvel. Aye. Becker. Aye. All right, motion carries six to zero. Um, someone willing to make a motion on the, the first item? I move um, the employment of administrative staff on probationary contracts for the 2021-22 school year. Second. Uh, any discussion on that? Um, I, I will just add that, uh, Andrew, I 100% I disagree with you. Um, the, the role of the board is not to hire staff, nor is it to fire staff. That is the job of the superintendent. It is our job to uh, assess the superintendent. So if there are hires that are made that we disagree with, that's where we carry that out. Um, so certainly can have that discussion and, and carry it out through the work session process. Um, but as a principal, uh, disagree with that concept. That's not what we're voting on here today. Um, I'm okay with uh, separating these to get you to vote on uh, the things that you agree with and, and be able to vote no on the things you don't, um, but in principle, uh, disagree wholeheartedly with that uh, perspective. So are you, are you also proposing that although the one on here um, was an internal was an internal transfer and really someone who's already a principal, are you then saying that you either support or already have discontinued the practice of a board member being part of the interview process for principals when it's their school? There's there's no policy on that, so we're not required to do that. Yep, it, well, they're right. There's not, and so. Again, I think there's, unfortunately, what we're seeing is uh, taking a part of, of structures that worked well and provided some balance. I, we were only doing it for principles. Um, we're, just, we're just taking apart structures that have evolved to have some kind of a balance between, I guess what I refer to for lack of any better term as the hands-on and hands-off perspective. So I guess, yep. Yeah, Another thing that should have been in policy and voted voted yes or no, but was never done. I, I would I would argue though that I did just sit in on the in the interview process on a principal, and we have been doing that for quite a long time. So um, and I don't see that going away actually. Yeah, so. Eric does. So I guess we'll have to sort that out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we certainly can have that discussion. I mean, the way that I would see it is we have a superintendent who comes in, looks at the existing policies, which are the expectations uh, from the board of directors on how the district operates and executing on those policies. Um, so to say that there's structures in place, um, I, I just, just disagree with that. So, all right. Um, we had a Motion on the first part, the employment of administrative staff. We had a second. Um, Beth, do you want to do a voice vote again? Okay, go ahead. McCoy. Aye. Aye. Becker. No. Warren. Aye. Smith. Aye. Welch. Aye. Uh, motion carries five to one. All right, uh, and then moving on to administrative organization chart. Andrew, I'll give it back to you. Um, 
Thank you. So my only reason for for separating and perhaps the perhaps the correct time to look at um, and here it would here it would be some kind of an amendment because I don't I don't have a problem with the fact that it adds positions that are currently grant funded, um, but do the positions that are grant funded actually sunset or is it just the table talk that we had which is likely accurate that there would be an, probably be enough attrition that if the additional positions were performing well there'd be retirements to shift people into which i approve but again it's about if it's um if it's important that everything we do be in um you know, be in writing, I would rather see the, the position sunset. Uh, and I wanted to get that out there. Although, again, I'll, I'll concede the time to do it might be uh, at the time of the hire to have it be on a, on a contract limited time, um, rather than in something that would auto renew past years. So I just wanted to see where we are with that and what the expectation is. But again, it might be a time to make a motion uh, later when the hiring happens. Steve, do you want to speak to Andrew's question? Sure. So the intent is to uh, use attrition uh, across the administrative team uh, to reset uh, so that at the end of the uh, uh, flow of dollars uh, through the uh, ESSER streams uh, that the positions in the administrative team equal those that were present prior to uh, the addition of those dollars. Uh, because the intent is not to sunset the position that's hired, uh, but through attrition, uh, other positions, I'm not sure how you would set it up uh, to include a sunset uh, on those other positions. Okay, I guess I'll wait for an I'll wait for an amendment or to vote differently until the time that the positions are coming online, and maybe there could be some some discussion ahead of time, perhaps something about a motion that certainly the board could revisit if there was a need, but that uh, after you know three years, the number of administrative positions would not be higher than X plus any new positions the board chose to add during that time. Um, that being said, I will vote yes on the, on the chart. All right, uh, absent any other discussion, I would uh, look for a motion to approve the organizational chart as presented. So second. Motion made by McCoy, seconded by Warren. Uh, any other discussion? All right, go ahead, Beth. Well, excuse me, Welch. Aye. Smith. Aye. Warren. Aye. McCoy. Aye. Vanden Hoover. Aye. Becker. Aye. Motion carries six to zero. Uh, moving on in the agenda, we have our legislative update. Um, I just want to point out that uh, Trustee Laura Layden and Warren um, was appointed as our legislative liaison. Um, certainly don't want to speak for her. Uh, obviously, she's absent tonight. And Steve, I believe you're prepared uh, to give this update. But um, going forward, especially at the speed at which things are moving, um, Steve is plugged in on a, a daily basis and, and well positioned to uh, provide this legislative update. Um, so, uh, I can let Laura speak to that in the future, but, um, Steve going forward, you'll be heavily involved in that legislative liaison report of that update. Uh, and so I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. Uh, and I'll just offer that really the biggest and most important thing on our agenda right now is dealing with, uh, the budget process moving through the state legislature, uh, joint finance committee, and then, uh, into the legislature as a whole. Uh, and the real issue there that uh, is of most concern to us in the district uh, is that uh, right now the, uh, the budget as proposed does not uh, meet the maintenance of effort requirements that the federal government has put in place um, for the uh, ESSER uh, funding streams that are set to come to the state of Wisconsin. Uh, right now, absent an amendment to that joint finance committee budget as proposed, uh, the state uh, stands to lose $2.4 billion dollars uh, in federal education support that would be spread out amongst uh, all the 400 plus school districts in the state. Uh, the uh, number of uh, districts, uh, both large, small, uh, rural, suburban, urban, that have been uh, petitioning uh, state legislatures to state legislators 
uh, to step up and make that revision uh, continues to increase on a daily basis. Uh, I just wrote to uh, our legislative delegation today to help them understand the impact that this would have in Green Bay. Uh, for us, it would uh, primarily affect the second two uh, ESSER streams. So that is over $60 million uh, of targeted support that's uh, directed towards uh, the school district. Uh, obviously, that would uh, be an enormous challenge for us. Uh, if you want to operationalize it and understand the impact, uh, today over 6,000 students started summer school in Green Bay. Uh, that's an amazing opportunity for those children and the families uh, here in the community. Uh, we were able to make that happen because we were able to combine traditional summer school funding provided by the state um, with those uh, federal uh, support funds to ensure that we had not only the morning academic component, but also an afternoon enrichment component, a wraparound care component with our community partners uh, and serving those children uh, breakfast and lunch and providing transportation. So uh, that's something that we plan to do over the course of the next four years. Uh, as we look to uh, ensure that students are on grade level and ready to go. Uh, that program uh, would obviously be in significant jeopardy if those uh, funds evaporated uh, because the state does not provide the funding that we need uh, to support summer school at that level. That's just one example of where those uh, ESSER dollars are going to work for our children and families and community. Uh, and one of the reasons that we are speaking up vocally um, with not only our legislators, but legislators across the state to encourage them uh, to revise that uh, budget presentation uh, coming out of the Joint Finance Committee prior to approval to ensure that that maintenance of effort uh, component is satisfied for the federal government. Um, any questions on that for Steve? Steve, do you have a uh, sort of next steps or a timeline in terms of how this is going to progress? And do we have any hard deadlines in terms of uh, advocacy and making our voices heard on this? Uh, the time to do it really is now. Uh, at the rate it's moving, uh, we anticipate that there could be uh, some type of, of hopefully forward movement by the end of this week. Uh, so my letter to the uh, legislators went out today. Um, we'll also be uh, working or are working with the other large uh, districts in the state, the big five. Uh, we've authored a uh, letter to the editor and an uh, opinion article that we'll be forwarding to local news media. Uh, we've also put together a, a short video to help people understand the impact. Uh, we are pushing all of those out this week. Uh, I presume that that will generate uh, some requests for the media uh, for follow up, which we will provide. Uh, but we're encouraging everyone who has uh, an interest and a willingness to reach out to their legislators this week uh, in the hopes, again, that uh, the forward movement will come by the end of the week. Thank you. Uh, any other questions there? Go ahead, Andrew. Um, just to, you know, as we get new people uh, coming to and being involved in, um, you know, board meetings, we use, uh, we use Big Five a lot. Could you just... Um, just state for those who aren't familiar what uh, who the big five are and like where we fit in in size when we say big five. Certainly, thank you, Andrew. Uh, that are those are the largest five districts uh, in the state. It includes Green Bay, Kenosha, Madison, <laughs> Milwaukee, and Racine. Uh, the Green Bay Area Public School District is the fourth largest district in the state. Okay, thank you. All right, anything else? All right, thank you, Steve. All right, um, next we have a number of uh, action items. Um, many of these items uh, came to us in our work session last month, had robust discussion around them, uh, got presentations from the staff. Um, it'll take some time to move through these. Uh, some of them certainly will warrant other discussions here at the table, but uh, for anybody watching as we move through these, uh, much discussion has been had on a lot of these topics to this point. So uh, Laura, I believe you'll be making motions for us tonight. I move that the new secondary courses for the 2022-23 school year as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion on the courses? All right, go ahead, Beth. I believe we'll be voting online for these. All votes have been entered and the motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. All right, motion carries 
Uh, B. Again. Sorry. B. Um, I move that the English language arts and science research, resource adoptions and the corresponding budget request of $1,239,593.52 as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? Go ahead, Beth. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried. All board members have voted in favor. Motion carries 6-0. Letter C. I move that the YMCA of Green Bay be approved to provide services for the 21st Century Community Learning Centers and or Fund 80 community-based after-school programs for the 2021-22 school year for Baird, Beaumont, Doty, Eisenhower, Howe, Sullivan, and Tank Elementary Schools. Second. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay, so I certainly support the selection of YMCA for, for these. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, do we have, what kind of, uh, if any, uh, what kind of options do we have? And I understand that, um, you know, these are schools that qualify uh, grant-based, uh, but do we have, or are we looking into what might be available at, at other places? Or is this just a motion right now because of when we have to do it for a grant timing? Um, are, are you asking to, to get this into other schools? Well, I mean, to I, get after school I, programs. I guess the question is, are you know what um, what would have to happen for that, or do we have, or do we in fact have some? I know there's there could be other things like community you know community partners that aren't funded by this this grant. So I just wanted to get get that um, get some discussion on that. Yeah. Um, I, I'd be happy to speak to that unless there's somebody available that wants to jump in. Uh, just from my, uh, my former role, uh, we applied uh, for 21st Century Learning Center grants, um, operated and partnered with the school district. So um, the, the funds there are federal funds given to the state of Wisconsin, which then we apply for. Um, the district applies for those uh, grants. Uh, sometimes the, the grant process uh, certainly is collaborative, but the district is the official grantee. Then the district puts out a request for proposal for any community partners that are interested in operating those sites. Um, as it mentions there, some of the sites are funded just strictly through those federal dollars. Others uh, use some combination of maybe federal dollars and or fund 80 to uh, fund those sites. Um, in the past, there's there had always been robust discussion about uh, you know where are successful sites, how many students are attending those sites, where are the sites most needed. So I know that that conversation uh, happens regularly. Um, it's certainly, you know, we could probably make an argument that uh, many of our schools could benefit uh, from these programs. So it's just a matter of uh, need versus resource and how we can expand those. Um, so uh, historically, the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club had filled out those uh, requests for proposal. Um, this process goes back at least 2014 and probably well before that. I know community learning, 21st century community learning centers began in the early 2000s, I believe. So it's as much knowledge as I have on the topic. I don't know if you had a specific question or maybe well, somebody else can answer. Is it, I guess, is are the, um, are we, are we doing or looking to do any, are there after school opportunities that exist of some kind outside of these 21st century learning providers and I think there are, I'm sure okay there are things always you know available after school and I know there's some some things that might not be exactly part of this with some wraparound care some this I just wanted to sure so other other that. after school opportunities yeah. other than these that right. I that I couldn't speak to okay so overall after school as a separate, okay. All right, so uh, good, good questions, Andrew, and we certainly can uh, maybe get an update sometime soon, whether on an education committee agenda or here on just the overall landscape of our after school programming, probably relevant as we uh, move forward into next school year as well. Um, any other discussion on the motion? 
All right, we're ready, Beth. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried. All board members voted in favor. All right, motion carries 6-0, letter D. I move that the Boys and Girls Club of Green Bay. Oh, I'm sorry. I move that the Boys and Girls Club of Green Bay be approved to provide services for the 21st Century Community Learning Centers and or fund 80 community-based after-school programs for the 2021-22 school year for Dan's and Fort Howard Elementary Schools. Second. Any discussion? Right. Beth? Yeah. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried. All board members voted in favor. All right. Motion carries six to zero. Moving on to letter E. I move that, that microphone. Forgive me. Um, I move that the that pursuant to the lease with option to purchase agreement between the Green Bay Area Public School District and Cup of Joy Ministries Inc. that the district exercise the option to purchase the property formerly known as Cup of Joy, located at two three two South Broadway Street, Green Bay, Wisconsin, for a purchase price not to exceed the terms of. Purchase price set forth in the agreement be approved. Second. Uh, discussion. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay, so um, although although yes, I'm I'm aware that there would be a, a bit of cost of cost savings if we were to purchase at at lease end. Um, I you know, I supported, I supported a year ago, um, leasing with excellent terms that we negotiated that some of the lease goes towards purchase if we purchase over the whole two years. Um, we don't have that much working knowledge of what this, what this building does because it wasn't available for, for much of the time during COVID. Leasing for another year under a lease that's already signed and we're committed to would um, would give us the year. Um, I understand other advantages. You can do some you can do some construction, but you know, to me and as as far as as far as what people have been contacting me about this building, uh, I've got to say there's not <clears throat> there's maybe not a whole lot left anymore that people who self-identify as conservative and people who self-identify as progressive agree on anymore. But I have to say that people of both of those self-identifications uh, told me loud and clear that they would, they don't see voting yes to purchase this building as a, as a good idea. It's a, we have a, we have a lease in progress that will give us a year to see if this, what this building really does for us. And it's an already signed lease. Uh, I would, uh, I'm voting no tonight and would like to see where we're at in a year when the lease is up and vote yes or no accordingly. Any other discussion? Thoughts on the matter? Um, so I'll jump in then. Um, you know, I see a lot of uh, short-term and long-term benefits to acquiring this property. Um, you know, from a, a short-term perspective, I shared the, the example where I've run into families in this building trying to find out where they're supposed to go, uh, oftentimes non-English uh, speakers. Um, I think that for many families where education is not, uh, doesn't provide a level of comfort, um, that we, there's a lot to be desired in this building. Uh, it's very institutional, it's very cold. Um, and so as a short-term solution, um, I like what uh, that facility can offer to us. Um, I think long-term from an investment, uh, just knowing the, the development of the city, uh, the future of the shipyard, the movement of the coal piles, property in this area, um, uh, is going to go up in value. Um, and certainly, uh, again, the short-term benefits of that property. 
um, I think are there. Um, you know, I don't know, but I, I would uh, venture a guess that the future of the district office building and this facility is not, you know, uh, going to be the long-term solution as we look at other district facilities. Um, I've got to admit that, uh, you know, Steve, as you, you talked about, it's kind of the uncertainty of the budget and, and maybe if you can connect those two uh, from a, a funding standpoint and also the uncertainty with the state budget um, just makes me a little bit weary to say, we're not really sure where that's going to land and we need a lot to do a lot of advocacy work and the answer seems to be pretty straightforward. And then at the same time, um, again, I agree in principle with everything that this building stands for, again, short term and long term, but to have just gotten that update on funding uncertainty versus uh, this facility. I do want to add, uh, Steve, and then I'll, I'll send it over to you. Um, I did take a tour of that facility. I've been in that building. I believe most of the other board members have. Um, it, it, it's, there's an unsafe situation for our staff there right now with just some of the layout. Um, so, you know, if, if there is, uh, I understand not wanting to put a bunch of money into uh, a building that we don't own, but, uh, you know, perhaps a, a compromise is to agree to make some safety uh, enhancements to that facility because our, uh, it's, certainly the building is not welcoming as it stands uh, as I walk through there. So those are just some thoughts that I'm wrestling with. Again, I, I approved uh, entering into this lease. I do think that uh, short term and long term, there's benefits to that building. Um, I guess, uh, Steve, do you have any reaction to that rambling, uh, maybe sometimes incoherent statement? No, I understand where you're coming from on there. And I've got uh, Pete and Mike on the uh, line here too. And I'll let Pete talk a little bit more about the finances in just a moment. But, uh, uh, you know, I guess the, the bottom line for us, uh, as we look at it is, uh, we see a significant value uh, add to the district uh, from the facility standpoint uh, in terms of the, the square footage and the access to it, but most importantly, uh, the ability for uh, new families to the district uh, to be able to access the services that they need uh, through a one-stop, one-door uh, model uh, where they're able to come in and, and uh, take care of the uh, issues that they need for enrollment, uh, food service, transportation, special education, uh, English language programming, uh, literally in one place um, without having to uh, either navigate their way through the, our facility uh, or to be um, stuck in a position where they're simply waiting for uh, our staff to, uh, to be able to connect with them and help them uh, work through that uh, under the current model. So uh, we see great uh, uh, benefit uh, for students and families. Um, in terms of the facility itself, uh, we think that uh, it's a, uh, a uh, fair price for it now, as Andrew did indicate, uh, there is a financial benefit for us executing sooner rather than later. Uh, and we think that uh, if that's the direction that we're intending to uh, move, that uh, the best time to execute that decision is now because it creates the greatest amount of savings for the district. Pete, you wanna jump in? Sure. Uh, I have a couple weeks left in the district uh, and I'll be going back into retirement. So I probably have the least amount of investment in the purchase of this property and I can unequivocally um, let the board know and, and uh, say to the board without any vested interest, um, this is a wise financial move for the board. First of all, um, you'll save a year's worth of lease. Um, you've paid 11 months of the first 12 months of the lease and Andrew is absolutely right. There's a second year to the lease. Um, part of the lease payment does go toward a principal retirement. Uh, we do have an appraisal for far more uh, than what the purchase price was on this property. And I would hate like heck that anybody other than the district would be able to wrestle the property away from the district through this lease. Um, I think acting on the purchase now is the wisest thing to do. Uh, it's money that would uh, be aidable. It saves you about um, $52,000 worth of lease payments. Um, purchasing the property makes the best economic sense to do so now. Uh, the property is used on a daily basis. The footprint, there isn't a day where the footprint is not used uh, by the district. And we had a great relationship with the Cup of Joy Ministries where they will allow us to use the parking lot during the day because most of their events were in the evening and on the weekend. It was a, a wonderful opportunity to share that parking lot uh, we um, assisted with the maintenance and uh, upkeep of that parking lot so that we could utilize it. 
Um, I, I just think it would be a fool's errand for the district to lose the opportunity to have this part and parcel of what would be uh, the district operations at the DOB building uh, and then have it sold to another um, entity, especially with the potential of price escalation, sold to another entity, uh, purchased away from the district out of the lease uh, and then utilized during the day and uh, in such a way that would hamstring uh, the utilization of the footprint uh, for the district. I think also planning uh, for what the building could be used for in its entirety would be better uh, suited if it was purchased by uh, the district. And then, um, you know, all holds would be, would be off and you could plan and utilize that building as you, as you need. Uh, the district is uh, definitely in a situation where that footprint, not only the property footprint, but the building, building footprint would be utilized. All right. Uh, any other questions? Go ahead, Laura. Um, I don't know if this is a question for Pete or for Mike. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you, uh, your inspection process and what you've, um, what you've done so far to kind of assess what might need to be done to this building? I was, when I toured it, it I was really happy to see that there are people already working there, but it's kind of a quirky building. So, you know, but, but it has a lot of potential. That's kind of what I came away with. So when you, when you looked at it thoroughly and inspected it, uh, kind of what did you, you know, um, were there any things, um, major issues or concerns that you came away with? That's all. Well, we're, you know, we're aware that there is work that needs to be done with the building. Um, the mechanical system is old. Um, we would like to, you know, upgrade the mechanical system to bring it up to the same level as the rest of our buildings. Um, and of course, you know, you've been inside. Um, there's no natural light. So there are windows that have been blocked in that would like to open up. Um, we take out some of the raised floor areas and make it more accessible and more usable. Um, However, we're hesitant to put that type of money into the building under our lease. Good. Go ahead, Don. Steve, I know when we when I had toured, you had talked, we had just talked about the potential costs to make the changes to the building after it's purchased. And you had said there was a potential to be using ESSER dollars for that. And depending on you know what the final decision was on how we're going to be using that building, but is that at jeopardy given the budget concerns? So part of the uh, uh, role of funding is it depends on the uh, purpose for which the facility is utilized. So you're right that depending on the determination for what uh, programming uh, lives in the building, uh, we may have access to dollars uh, in order to do that. Uh, one thing I would offer is that uh, our, uh, our ESSER dollars come to us in three streams. The two that are in jeopardy right now uh, are ESSER two and three. Um, so we still have uh, approximately $8 million of money that came to us in the ESSER one stream um, that we have available uh, to use for various programming needs uh, and support throughout the district. Um, so uh, I, I guess that's probably the, the most direct answer to that. Pete, is there anything else we should add? No, oh, just the purchases made during this fiscal year return aid to us in the following year. This would be an aidable purchase. Um, you know, you could delay that aid payment, as Andrew said, by making the lease um, offer to purchase next year. I guess I just really question why you'd spend another $52,000 in rent when you're going to buy the building anyway. Um, you know, that's just my take on it. And you would return that aid a whole year sooner. So not only do you save money, with respect to not having to pay the lease payment, but you also save money on the fact that the aid is returned to the district quicker. It, it's just a fiscally smart move. Go ahead, Andrew. Right, so I, I guess if if I were if I were certain that conditions and need would be different in a year, I mean the the correct vote if you are if you're either certain that we need this building right now, or if you were certain that whether or not we need it now, we will need it next year, then yes, then vote yes and save the, the difference in the money. Um, I'm not, I, 
I'm not certain that we need it now. And I'm not certain that we need it in a year. I'm not also committed a year in advance to a, to a no vote. If this vote happens next year, I'll look at the situation mm-hmm. as, as it is. Um, you know, if, if I knew for sure it was the thing to do, then I would, I would vote yes. But I think the, the compromise that resulted in a lease with option to purchase with right of first refusal, with a partial credit of lease payment towards an eventual purchase, should we do it? Um, I think that's, I think everything is really, um, really well covered there. Um, And I think that's the the right option. So I'll be a no on a purchase and I'm open to listening to it again next year if we stay on the lease. Any other discussion? All right, Beth, we're all set. All votes have been entered and the motion has carried. The results of the individual board member votes are as follows. Vanden Heuvel, yes. Smith, yes. Becker, no. Warren, yes. McCoy, yes. Welch, yes. All right. Motion carries five to one. Uh, moving on to letter F, Laura. I move that effective July 1st, 2021, the hourly rate for co-curricular event workers be increased from 12 dollars per hour to thirteen dollars per hour as presented be approved second any discussion all right go ahead beth you see it there it is All votes have been entered. The motion has carried. All board members have voted in favor. All right, motion carries six to zero, letter G. I move that effective September 1st, 2021, the daily rate of pay for substitute slash guest teachers be increased from $150 per full day, $75 half day to $190 full day on $95 half day and that substitute guest teachers working 21 or more consecutive days in the same assignment be increased from $190 full day, um, which is 95 for a half day, to $210 full day, $105 half day. As presented, be approved. Second. Any discussion? Go ahead, Beth. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried. All board members have voted in favor. All right, motion carries 6-0, letter H. I move that effective September 1st, 2021, the hourly rate for substitute support staff be increased from $12 per hour to $15 per hour, that substitute support staff working 21 or more consecutive days in the same assignment be compensated at $16 per hour as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? Beth? All votes have been entered. The motion has carried. All board members have voted in favor. All right, motion carries 6 0, letter I. I move that the employee handbook be amended with respect to the tool and safety payment as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? So the one thing that I'll add here, uh, Steve, I didn't get to to touch base with you on this ahead of time, but maybe something to look into. Um, Certainly approve this. Uh, I was shocked to learn that we require our staff to bring their own tools. Uh, I found out from my brother who works in a similar field that yeah, this is pretty common practice. Um, 
but there are uh, some staff in our district who are required to maybe wear steel toed boots or have to do some of that for, from an instruction standpoint. I know this doesn't speak to that specifically and, and maybe that's addressed. Maybe there is a stipend there, but uh, just something to look into Steve, if, if there are staff that are working with students uh, and are we uh, compensating them for, for those things as well. And Mike, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, uh, but just some, something that somebody brought up to me and I'm, I forgot to, to bring it up earlier. So no need to respond now unless you want to. No, I can. Um, we are providing a stipend for steel tip shoes and safety glasses. And that is part of this motion. Uh, we're actually raising it to bring in line with the, today's costs. Sure. What is now is that just for uh, the maintenance staff or is that also for any instructional staff that may need those things? Um, this uh, language requires um, maintenance staff. Specific okay. staff. Sure. And, and absolutely supportive of that. I just didn't know if uh, a staff had reached out to me and said that he's required to wear steel toed boots and if he would be included in that as well. So again, didn't mean to open up a can of worms, but maybe something to, to see if that's the case. So. All right, any other discussion there? All right, go ahead, Beth. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. Right, motion carries 6-0, letter J. I move that the proposed revisions to Board of Education Policy 151, the adoption, revision, maintenance, and dissemination of board policy as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? Go ahead, Andrew. I, I, have, I have one. Uh, so this is, I mean, this does codify that policy is introduced and recommended um, it used to have to go through a, a work session and, a, and then be at a regular, except for emergencies. Now it's committee meeting. Um, but again, it's only, um, it's only policy and governance committee. So uh, I, still, I still think that committees should have the ability to recommend, um, recommend policies. If there's a curriculum policy, I think it should be able to go through education. I know we talked about this somewhat last time. Um, I don't have the schedule in front of me. What does the, um, does do education policy are the same night, right? Or are they, which, which is first, which comes earlier in the month? Policy or education? Policy does. Okay, so then microphone reader. So then the problem is the education committee has a policy idea, right? It will wait. Um, policy has already happened, so it just delays things even even further for something to be enacted because it has to go through a, a policy committee. Unless I'm missing something. So if it requires a policy, uh, you could uh, certainly be moving uh, those two in tandem uh, if you knew uh, the process that was underway. Well, sure, but I mean, the purpose isn't the purpose of committee work to have some of the, you know, some of the discussions that would lead to, I mean, that's, that's the whole reason of moving from informal work sessions to formal committee work, right? Yes, you want to do the work at the table. So the the policy, the purpose of the policy and governance committee is to be that final review of changes that of those policies. And certainly they are not the super policy committee or the super committee. And if the operations committee, the education committee have changes to policy, the groups can get together, have a meeting. I, I don't foresee there to be a delay simply because the policy committee needs to review the changes of the language that um, to ensure consistency, those sorts of things. The education committee and the operations committee can certainly make changes to policy and, and bring those forward. The, the policy committee can review that and then bring it to the board. There are not too many circumstances where there is an emergency to get a policy done. And if there is, we're, we can always form those um, 
committee of the whole meetings, those work, those work meetings, and we could facilitate the process that way, which will also be the policy and governance committee at those meetings. So I, I think we're, we'll have to, you know, see how this goes along. We're all going to be new at this. And in, in other districts that I have experience with, it's worked great. And there, there have not been issues. So I don't know, Steve, if you want to add anything to that. Nope. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay, so the, the, the regular meeting ordinarily is in week one, and then policy, or is it in week two, and then policy, either way, the order is board meeting, then policy, then education, right? Okay, in separate, each in separate weeks. Okay. And sometimes, and sometimes they'll bounce around for holidays or something, but the order would be presumably maintained. Okay. So that means though, it still means if education has a policy idea that comes up in their committee meeting, which is something that is presumably good, it would then have to, so then in a, a week or a couple of weeks, depending how long the month is, we get to the board meeting. Then we get to the policy committee the next week. And then we'd have to wait another couple of weeks to the board meeting. So there would, it would, there would always be a board meeting in between that it wouldn't even be eligible for, for consideration. So if you had something you wanted to, and I guess right now you could, you could have a period of, um, a period of as short as a couple of weeks, right? There are really infrequent circumstances where a policy needs to be fast tracked and, and changes need to happen in that short of a time frame. The policy does recognize that there it could be approved at a special board meeting. Again, we could call a meeting of the whole as a, a work group and we could address it that way if there is an immediate need. I as I proposed at our work session or our retreat, the policy review committee is going to be going through series and they're going to be on a rotation and that will involve the work of the education committee as well as the operations committee. So it's it's not going to be the case where we are not going to be staying up to date when there are legal changes. It usually gives us some time to implement those legal changes in the policy. I, I am not too concerned about the timeline given exactly what you had stated, Andrew, with those several weeks being in there. Yeah, and I'll just jump in really quick. Um, from my perspective, this new model gives us more time to think through, to research. So uh, what we're, you're perceiving we're losing in, in quickness because we don't have a meeting back to back and can get something done in two weeks, it gives us time to gather feedback, bring more voices to the table, to think through things, to ask questions. Um, in, in the current model, sometimes all of that happens really quickly. In an event where there is a policy that needs to get passed immediately, there's built-in uh, ways, special meetings or work sessions or what have you. Um, but what, uh, what is perceived as delaying things and moving slower to me is, is uh, getting more feedback and being more thorough. And I just offer that uh, one of the things that we have on those uh, committees is we have a calendar of work that's really designed to pace the work of each of the committees. Uh, and uh, hopefully by doing that, we're very deliberate in the work that we're doing and the pace that we're doing it. Um, and to uh, Melissa's earlier comment, uh, the intent would be that we not find ourselves in an emergency situation, but that we actually have uh, the work uh, timed out and spaced out to allow for uh, either one or more committees to deal with it appropriately before it comes to the board for action. I, I'll, I mean, the, I think the transition to committees overall will be good. So I'm, I'm not going to vote over the one detail I have some real reservations about. I'm not going to vote no, but I am, I guess to me, to me, the discussions that we've been having over the past few months make it clear that if board if board members want something different to be done in the district the answer isn't table discussion and the answer isn't informal resolutions the answer is the answer is change a policy or perhaps uh, perhaps a rule so if you had for example something 
but you did want to get done before, um, you know, before the school year started, I guess is something that comes to mind, whatever that might be. It's going to be pretty hard to do under this system unless you went through the emergency process and there'd be a lot of resistance and rightfully so to taking something that isn't a, a pressing emergency must pass or you lose funding kind of thing uh, to take it out of order. So I'll vote, I'll vote yes, but I'm, I'm really concerned that again, this is just stretching out a process that already called for a minimum of um, two rounds of, of meeting and discussion. Any other discussion? All right, Beth, we're ready to vote on item J. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried. All board members have voted in favor. All right, motion carries six to zero. Uh, Kay, Laura. I move that the proposed revisions to Board of Education Policy 170 regular and special meetings of the school board as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? Andrew? Um, so I just want to be clear because this, and uh, it does of course make sense that this, um, this creation committee spreads out over several policies, but I want to make sure I avoid a situation where I can't propose an amendment because of the order that something else was already voted on. So I guess the first question I had is, um, wasn't there some stronger language in the last meeting that said that there would be two student reps on each committee? And if, if so, where did it happen? And if it's, if it's wrong, tell me I'm wrong, but I thought it was very explicitly spelled out. So nothing has changed since our last meeting. This is exactly the language you reviewed at the last meeting. Policy 170 and Rule 170 speak to students. And then we have Rule 441.2, which also speaks to students participating. And if you give me a second, I can tell you exactly where that is in 441.2. It is in section E, number 1A, the Intercity Student Council is entitled to two non-voting seats on the Green Bay Area Public School District Board for all regular and all regular set and work session and standing committee meetings that at least one member will be present at those meetings. And then E1B, it is the responsibility of the council to assign up to two students to attend each regular work session and standing committee meeting and with the understanding that at least one of these members will be present at these meetings. So that's where that specific language I think you are looking for Andrew is. And then in the policy, going back again to the exact language that was proposed on May 24th. Sorry, I so many changes in here. I don't have it memorized. Oh, here it is in section in the pol policy 170 section Roman numeral 4 B. Six intracity student council representatives shall be permitted to attend standing committee meetings and have the same rights afforded to them in accordance with the Board of Education policy regarding their participation and attendance and then that cross references policy 441 and the rule. Okay, no, no oh, sorry. okay I, I had mistakenly thought that there was something that more explicitly said in the place where the um, committees are created that there would be um, that there would be a two the two student reps, but it sounds like <laughs> the other places where that is stated does say that there will be two student reps. In that case, though because there's some reference to student reps there's some reference to intercity student council reps if if i were to make an amendment with the intent of allowing 
uh, in consultation with intra student council, sometimes there could be a time to have uh, a student appointed who maybe isn't a member of the council, or if there's, uh, for example, a situation where the council isn't, isn't complete yet um, for the year, can that be done entirely in 441 or does something or is there going to be some language here that would preclude someone that would bar a student representative who's not an ICSC member? So policy 440, or I'm sorry, the rule for 441.1 gives ICSC the right to have two student reps on each committee. If you want additional student reps, in addition to the two student reps from ICSC, the, the policy as written for policy 170 and rule 170 speaks to the composition of a committee, which is the three school board members is what makes up the official committee. Anyone else that you would bring in to speak on a particular topic or to um, give input on a particular matter would not be an official member of those committees. They would be people you would bring in, again, as that collaborative process that the committee is going to engage in. For example, I, um, the committee that Laura, Leighton and Warren and I will be doing with respect to the policy committee, we're first gonna tackle policy series 600 and 900. We'll bring in Pete and Mike and now Josh and, and his staff to collaborate on those policy series. And then when they're done, they're done with their work with that committee. And then the three board members will move on to the next topic. So there, there's not official members of the committee other than the board. Okay, so that's really helpful. So we're not looking to build members of a committee and this is, these are the people on and this is longstanding regardless of the issue. The, the committee is solidly made up of the three board members and then given a specific topic can invite people to participate. Um, but there is also public participation. So how do, what is the difference between, uh, we invite Mike and Pete to come because it's uh, relevant to the series that we're talking about versus, um, a uh, constituent comes in, wants to attend that meeting and wants to say something or wants his voice to be heard. It's the same as the board is functioning right now. You invite, you set your agenda, you invite members of the administration, members of staff, members of the community to present to you regarding a particular topic they present to you. If the members aren't invited to present the, to the board that night, they certainly are able to provide their um, participation, just like they did tonight, their five minutes of community participation. And, um, and the board can listen and have that input that way. So it's, it's really functioning very similar to the way your work sessions do right now, just in a more structured and focused environment to get the work, more work done in that environment. Now, Steve, do you wanna add anything to that? No, that was good, thank you. So student participation would fall under the same rules as, as the board. If they, if they choose to speak up, they can, but they're not, they're not, they can't vote and they, they're not really technically part of the committee. There's no voting on any of these committees because this is not, po this is not going to be posted for any voting. The two student reps have the same right that they would at a board meeting at those work committee meetings because the ICSC is the official representative body of the students. They can participate on those committees. They're not official members of those committees, just like they're not the official members of the board because they're not elected by the constituents of the district, but they get to participate in those committees. And if there's other students who have voice that are not are not invited by the board to participate. So again, I'm, I'm just gonna go back to what I know, the dress code policy. I anticipate our committee is going to be inviting in lots of people, teachers, staff, <laughs> administrators, students to give input on that dress code policy and we'll have that discussion and, and go from there. Okay, I think, I, think my, I think my question has been answered that I can at least get to queue with before I would need to potentially address my, my concern here. Um, so I, um, I just needed to make sure 
that something isn't going to be done later that would just be moot because of what was done in 170 because 170 came before 441. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions on that? So, oh, go ahead. Yes, sorry. So I'm going to assume that the Inner City Student Council understands this and knows that they have the right to send a student representatives to these committee meetings and that's been established already. Well, nothing's official until it's passed. So <laughs> um, yes, the information is out there, but then if Beth will work with the advisor just like she always does for the reps for these meetings and to get individuals assigned then to those committee meetings. But, I'm sorry, but no, this, is, yep. this is the purview of the, of the, um, of the high school principals that have, you know, and the, 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 um, the ICSC advisor and the <laughs> members of ICSC and the, the students that are involved to, to, to do this work and to send people that they want to send. I don't know the inner workings of ICSC, but they certainly have the workings to assign to student reps. I, I guess maybe they could speak to how they get assigned to, to these meetings. Um, so, sorry. In regards to like just assigning like school board meetings, we just, um, it's voluntary and each student we try to have um, attend one meeting. Um, as far as committee meetings, we haven't had any, like I know in the past there was like the CESA 7. Um, uh, we haven't had any of those meetings during my time, so I can't speak to that. But as far as attending school board meetings, we would just choose students who show interest. Emily, Stephanie, I do, maybe you were here when I asked this last time, maybe it was different reps, I apologize, but um, a lot of these meetings are proposed being at, uh, from 4.30 to 6 instead of 6 to later at night. Would you find that uh, from a student perspective, it's more appealing to volunteer and come to these meetings, these committee meetings, if they're at an earlier time? Um, um, I know I'm involved in my school, so with certain extracurriculars, they run typically more after school right away. So that would be more conflicting. Whereas if I had a soccer practice or something like that, I could get here um, and have to miss less of that. So I think the later times are better, but I feel like regardless, we can probably adjust since there's okay. not as many of these. Or depending on uh, the the topic, if it was dress code, for example, and we want a lot of, we could mm -hmm. always modify our start time to make sure that we're accommodating some of those things too. I mean, we'll never find a time that works for everybody, but we wanna make sure that that's, that works. So. Okay. Any other discussion there? All right, go ahead, Beth. I think we're, this is Kay, correct? Yes. Yes, all right. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried. All board members have voted in favor. All right, motion carries six to zero. Letter L, Laura. I move that the proposed revisions of Board of Education Rule 170 procedures for appointing school board members to preside over work session meetings as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? Go ahead, Beth. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. All right. Motion carries 6-0. Letter M. I move that the proposed revisions to the Board of Education Policy 171.2 Agenda Preparation and Dissemination as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? Go ahead, Beth. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. Motion carries 6-0, letter N. Now might be a good time to just remind everybody, and I know you already did this, but we've got a lot of, of votes still to take, that these have all been discussed. 
uh, some of them multiple times. Um, and, uh, and so if it looks like we're just kind of going through these quickly, um, it's not because they haven't been discussed. They have been at, usually at multiple meetings. So, okay, number N or letter N. I move that the proposed revisions to Board of Education Policy 187 public participation in school board meetings as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? Andrew? I just wanted to be clear too, because I wasn't sure about this the first time. Um, I know there's a lot of um, a lot of interest and sometimes emotion around um, public uh, participation policies, and there are while well, there are some wider things that are in flux right now, this change only adds public participation to the standing committee meeting, and it also means that um, it is uh, it is a forum, so it's not a and that is a the word forum means full open forum, correct? The word, it doesn't have to say open forum. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Okay, so it, it is, and I know you said two weeks ago, it would, or last time, it would be, it's an open forum. It's not a, for example, that the board meeting will be an open forum and the committee meetings would be limited to agenda topics forum. It is an open, forum and we don't have to have the word open forum because forum implies open forum so you can set the rules for for your forum so if what if you are allowing people to speak on matters not on the agenda then we cannot viewpoint discriminate and individuals are allowed to speak to anything that they want to speak about it does not need to be on the agenda just three. correct Okay, so the reason I was considering um, wanting to keep it mandatory that there be a work, the, the work session is because it guaranteed a second open forum. I know I was told in the last meeting that the committee meetings would have open forum before each one. Now, as a committee chair, I, you know, I will just always have an open forum at mine. I'm just concerned that I might be hearing something different now that the committee chair could decide whether it's an open forum or a topic limited forum. And if that's the case, now we don't have the, a guarantee that the public can attend two open forums a month, which is their right right now, they would only be guaranteed one. So I'm just trying to clarify which is I'm, I'm sorry, that's not what I said. The same rules that apply to the forum at the regular board meeting is what's going to apply to the meeting at the, the committee meeting. If you look at um, section 2A, number two, it was just clarified, a, a forum will be scheduled at the start of each standing committee meeting, comma, work session and regular board meeting. So it, it, it's the same thing. I, yeah. I'm sorry for being confusing if, I, if what I said was confusing but it's the same thing. Yeah. A full open forum and the committee chair, even if they want to, which I wouldn't, cannot limit yeah. forum topics. They can agenda topics, sure, but forum topics, those are open forums. Yeah, I mean- That would violate the first amendment if you did that. Yeah, so it says right there to allow comments to be made regarding issues of concern to the public, which is pretty broad, whatever issues are concerned to the public. The board may determine to allow public public comment during other portions of the meeting with proper notice under the state and federal law. So, yeah. It, okay, it's, I was it's just, still, it's just still making your, sure yes. we didn't have to have the word open yep. in there. I didn't realize the word open was never actually in there, but it's, it's important. So, okay, thank you. All right, any other discussion on N? All right, go ahead, Beth, we're ready to vote. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. All right, motion carries 6-0, letter O. I move that the Board of Education Policy 343.6 Virtual School as presented be approved. Second. <clears throat> Second. Any discussion? 
All right, go ahead, Beth. All votes have been entered and the motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. All right, motion carries 6-0, letter P. I move that the Board of Education Rule 343.6 Virtual School as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? Go ahead, Beth. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. Motion carries 6-0-Q. I move that the proposed revisions to Board of Education Policy 441.1, Student Government, as presented, be approved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Beth. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. Motion carries 6-0, letter R. I move that the proposed revisions to Board of Education Rule 441.1 Intercity High School Student Council Constitution and Bylaws as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? Go ahead, Andrew. So in looking this over, uh, if I am going to Article E, um, or E, which is Article 4, um, School Board Seat um, 1B. When I read this, I think the, the possibility does exist that the council, when it assigns up to two students, could... Uh, for whatever reason, um, look to assign a student perhaps who isn't a member because it says the council shall assign up to two students. If that's accurate, and again, there, there probably aren't a lot of situations where that would, would happen, uh, but I could see there being some, and I don't wanna get into the specifics of it, but if that's, if it says it's the responsibility of the council to assign up to two students, and they would be at least allowed to, whether they choose to or not, then I don't think I even need to propose an amendment. So could they? The last sentence says, and that at least one member will be present at these meetings. So I think it contemplates that it could be one ICSC member and one non-ICSC member. Okay, that sounds, if, if that is, I just know some, sometimes there have been interpretations that talking about members and, okay, so because it specifically says at least one member, then it contemplates there being a member and a non-member, and if that's, if that's the interpretation of it, then I don't think I even need to make an amendment. I, I, um, yeah, I think it would be more likely one than both. Doesn't that set a precedent, though? This is the current language. So the so the only thing that was added was and standing committee members. So ICSC can be again. I I, I don't micromanage ICSC, and so ICSC can determine how to assign those individuals to those to those meetings. But again, it's the purview of again, it's the purview of ICSC to do that. Or, this, or, some, or some other person in that school. It would be the purview of ICSC. Yes. All right, any other discussion? All right, Beth. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. 
Motion carries six to zero, letter S. I move that the proposed revisions to Board of Education Policy 531 telecommuting as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? Beth? All votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. All right, motion carries six to zero, letter T. I move that the Board of Education Policy 940, naming of facilities as presented be approved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Beth. All votes have been entered. The motion has carried with all board members voting in favor. All right, motion carries six to zero. And that is the end of our action items tonight. Uh, the last piece here is agenda setting. Uh, the attachment there does lay out uh, in July, uh, starting off with our new schedule. So you'll see that there is a proposed regular board meeting on July 12th. And then uh, the third Monday, July 19th, policy and governance operations committee. <coughs> and the 26 education and then potential for a work session. So I will be getting that new structure next month um, and looking forward to how that's gonna play out and help us to complete our work. Uh, any other comments? Otherwise I'd look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 and that is the end of our regular board meeting.